Centurion entered Swedish service in the 1950s. They came in three batches. The first batch came with 20 pounder guns. So did the second batch. These were known as the STRV-81. The third batch, well, they came direct from the factory with 105s, and they were the STRV-101. Now, if you haven't figured this out yet, the Swedish designation comes by the caliber of the gun. So the 20 pounder is about an 84 millimeter, eight centimeter range, so hence eight. And then once you have the caliber sorted out, then it's what is the number of the tank in that sequence of caliber. So 8.1 is the first tank with an eight centimeter caliber gun. And then the STRV 101 is the first tank in Swedish service with a 10 centimeter caliber gun, the 105. Well, in the early 1980s, these tanks were upgraded. Oh, by the way, before that, the uh, 81s are upgraded also with the 105 cannon, a little bit extra armor to make uh, STRV 102. Come the upgrades, laser rangefinders are added, making the 101R and the 102R. Then there's a gap in the sequence caused by the S tank, the STRV 103, which then brings us now to the STRV 104, in front of which I am standing at Arsenal. And I'm in Sweden, a little bit west of Stockholm. Thank you again to the Patreon, Subscribestar, PayPal, or anybody else that has contributed financially to make this episode possible. Now, I have covered Centurion before. There was a 7-1, as I recall, in Australia. But I haven't covered a Centurion like this. 1981, FMV, the Swedish Defense Material Administration, decided they were going to spend 150 million crowns upgrading the lethality of about 80 of the Centurion 100s. Then, 1983, they decided to devote another 150 million crowns upgrading the mobility. The work was to be split. Haglunds would take care of the hull, whilst the turret upgrades and final integration was to be done by a government-owned arsenal. If you look at the hull, well, obviously we now have ERA blocks. They were added towards the twilight of the tank's career by FFV, the local Swedish defense company. But otherwise, it's very similar to the Centurion Mark 10 that it came with. So you still have about 12 centimeters of sloped frontal armor. Down below, drops down to about 76. Similarly, you've got the better part of six inches of armor up by the uh, mantlet that came on the Mark 10. And the 105 millimeter is the same 105L7 that we've seen a few times now, except now we do have a thermal shroud covering the cannon. The driver's hatch is original, pretty much. And I do need to make a correction to the Australian video I did because I couldn't figure out, I couldn't open the hatches with those shrouds in a way. Well, it turns out if you move the periscopes to a certain angle, it is then possible to open up the hatches. Now, you will recall on the earlier Centurions, there was a drinking water tank front left of the vehicle and the hatch was right here. Well, this hatch is now not for drinking, it's diesel. And this is one of the changes that they made over time. So if you recall many moons ago, the meteor engined Centurion came with a pathetically small range. And there were a couple of solutions. One was to install a long range fuel tank on the back. The Australian Centurion had that. Another was to install a mono trailer with additional fuel and the Swedes took both. By putting the diesel in the front, as well as the main fuel tanks in the back, the overall fuel capacity of the STRV-104 is the same as that of the 102 and 101, except now it's a diesel, so it'll go further. You'll see a lot of mud on this vehicle as well, by the way, because this is a routine runner at this museum. So score one for the reliability. Uh, but you will see that they are still the original steel tracks with almost grouser like blades to grip into the mud but also grip into the roads and destroy them possibly not the most popular move there otherwise the mechanics of the hull and chassis remain generally unchanged from those in the centurion we saw before so i'm not going to spend any time except to note yes track tension is still done in the same place so as you come around to the side of the vehicle, we encounter the first of the major upgrades to make this the ultimate Centurion. 
they put steps into the side skirts. Now this may not seem like much until you have actually tried to climb a Centurion which has intact side skirts. It's annoying as all hell because you've got really nothing to grip between the hub and when you're going further up. So you've got to get up one end or the other. Uh, perhaps the sprocket wheel is the easiest option. But now these are relatively crudely created, but they work. So kudos. Moving past, you'll see that the bins, the stowage on the turret, these are all absolutely identical. The ammunition loading port is still there. And then you get to the next major difference, this air filter. So why a new air filter? Well, you gotta go back again to the Rolls-Royce Meteor. Fantastic engine for its time. In World War II, 600 horsepower, this thing is great. The problem is that by the 1980s, the figures aren't exactly the gold standard anymore. And also after a couple of decades of service, the things are just getting plain worn out. And so the Swedes decide that they're going to replace the engine. But why do all the work from scratch? Perhaps we can look abroad and see who else has upgraded the engines on their Centurions. And they look across the continent and they realize, ah, the Israelis down there have done it with their shots. So they asked the Israelis, may we buy one of your shots now? And again, in the 1980s, you're sort of starting to become a little bit older. And the Israelis say, well, maybe we'll sell you a hull if that's all you're interested in. Okay, say the Swedes. And so the Israelis send a shot hull over to Sweden, where the Swedes can now look at it and figure out just how it was that they were able to perform the upgrade from the Rolls-Royce Meteor to the 1790-2. Now, the engines that the Swedes ended up getting from Teledyne Continental weren't absolutely identical to those in short. The Swedes ended up getting the ABDS 1790-2 DC. But I'm told that even when the engines arrived for the conversion, that they came in two slightly different batches and weren't absolutely identical. They mated them to the similarly slightly modified Allison Cross Drive 850-6A. The simple dash six was in the short. But the general concept remains the same. You have to angle the engine about three degrees. You have to raise the engine deck, change it completely because it is a bigger engine. Compared to the old Rolls-Royce, the diesel puts out an extra 100 horsepower, which doesn't sound like a hell of a lot, but there's an additional 300 foot-pounds of torque as well. Plus, being a diesel, it is far more fuel efficient, and of course it is a new diesel, so absolutely not as clapped out as the old Rolls-Royce Meteors were. As you come around to the back of the tank, well, first you go past one of the taillights, there's one on the far side as well, and the gun travel lock, or gun crutch if you prefer on the left rear corner one of the lifting points and down below you got a point for towing the swedes did put an infantry telephone on their vehicles so it's a simple open uh, it's a disconnectable handset they have disconnected the handset spare track link all over so you got it on the rear hull you have track link on the turret rear both sides there is, you can just see at the top, also the two Lyran flare launchers for night fighting. Move a little bit further over still, and we have mounting points for either smoke grenades or flares. I'm going to go with the smoke grenades for now, unless somebody can tell me otherwise. I'm sure it's in the manual, but I don't speak Swedish, so it doesn't help me, and I haven't seen the manual. And then the fuel filler port on the top here. I shall now demonstrate the amazing utility of these holes in the side skirts as I mount up onto the engine deck. Oh, that was much easier. Well, I wish at this point I could show you more than just the exhaust bay. But uh, if you are curious, you modelers that are wondering where you should put exhaust and should you put much exhaust smoke on things. There is plenty of exhaust coming out of these two pipes right out the grills on the top here. You see there's a heat shield and deflector just above the transmission at the back here. Unfortunately, in order to open it, I'll need to remove the, the wraps around the exhaust pipes and it's just not worth it. So all I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna put the 
camera down so you can see the radiator inset shot here underneath that radiator is going to be the 29.3 liter v12 air cooled engine uh, which uh, as i say it's the same it's the 1790 it's been in american service from the m48s uh actually the petrol version has been even earlier than that uh through to the m60 before finally the turbines got rid of them but uh anyway yeah the exhaust compartment that was a lot of effort for an exhaust compartment. <laughs> I'm guessing that these, uh, these parts of the grills don't get taken up all that much. But it does beg the question, where do you access the engine? Fortunately, there's only the side one that you need to deal with with any regularity. Because that is where you'll find a dipstick. And fill a port. For what I'm going to assume is the transmission. Under the side gratings, well on each side you're going to see this yellow transmission oil cooler. Uh, there will be the piping which takes the air from the air filters out here which are changed. You have to undo the bolt first but you can do them. Underneath the grating on this side is the engine oil dipstick and I can't open this up because the turret's in the way I'd need to spin the turret over to the side which I don't feel inclined to do right now. So just finishing up the outside for part one of the 104 with the turret roof and the two 71 millimeter Lyran launchers. They'll go to about 1300 uh, meters with a full charge. As you can have a base charge and then you add an additional charge if you wanted to go further. So to confirm that box on the whole rear was for the smoke grenade launchers. So the Launchers are on the turret front and the spares are in the rear. The Lyran spares are mounted on the turret bustle on the outside. So that's it. Part one complete and part two, let's see what they have done to the insides. Peglins would take care of the whole work whilst the turret upgrades and final integration of the lot was given to an arsenal in South Sweden. The contract work was split up. Haglunds would do the work on the hull and a defense administration arsenal. They decided to split the contract work. Haglunds would work on the hulls and the turrets and then final integration would happen at a Swedish defense arsenal uh, government owned later on. And the short of course had upgraded the Meteor with an American Continental engine. Well, Thank you.